So the title of my sermon today is The M in Mother, The M in Mother, and I just had so many things that I wanted to say to you ladies that I thought that I would alliterate it. Uh, I come from, my grandmother was a single mom, my mom was a single mom, and so I am the recipient of good mothers, and I am married to a good mother, and so my heart today is just to encourage you in every possible way that I can to do my best to have you walk out of here feeling excited about your season, feeling excited about how God wants to use you. And so I thought about just the, the many M's that come with motherhood, and the first one for me is just memories. Uh, I have a lot of memories uh, about my mom. My my first really tangible memory of my mom was when she made a decision to take us to leave my dad, and she became a single mom. And I, I vividly remember that moment. I remember the look on her face. I remember the tears in her eyes. And I remember just this resolve that came over her, not only for her life, but for mine. And I watched her fill two roles. I watched her do her best to be dad and do her best to be mom, and I watched her tired, I watched her praying, I watched her emotional, I watched her strong, I watched her in all of those spaces. My mom came from a single mom. My grandmother, uh, her husband died in a car accident when he was 24 years old, and so she raised my mom and my aunt by herself and was a strong lady. I remember my grandmother working at, uh, at a restaurant uh, in her older age, just trying to pay bills for, for her, her girls. And so, so blessed by the women in my life. Uh, whenever I think about Timothy in the Bible, uh, Paul talks about Timothy's grandmother and mother and how they are the ones who planted seeds of faith in his heart. That's my story. My mom's the one who introduced me to Jesus. My mo mom is the one who said to me, honey, I don't think you love Jesus, right? My mom is the one that God used to have me fall in love with Jesus. My mom is the one who made the investments in me that now have grown into me being able to be a pastor at this incredible church. I have so, so, so many memories and so much honor that I need to give Elaine Maglioka today on Mother's Day. I love you so much. I... I she, had, she made me so much more than I could have been on my own. You know what I'm saying? And then I married Ashley Davenport. I, I remember uh, when my wife and I had this conversation around we should have a family. When we were dating, I said to my wife, I think that we need to wait five years to have kids. You don't have to do that. That's not biblical or, or whatever. But uh, uh, my, my wife went into labor with our oldest on our five-year anniversary. It's like God went, you said five years. You know, I'm just trying to play wrong. And so actually today is Noah's birthday. He's 12 years old today. Uh, yep. Happy birthday, Bubba. Love you. Yesterday was our 17-year anniversary. Uh, God, yeah. Uh, today is Mother's Day. What I'm trying to say is that this is a really expensive week for me. That's what I'm <laughs> That's not strategic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, no. Uh, but listen, I remember, I remember the conversation with my wife. We should have a family. Uh, I remember watching as we lost two babies, two miscarriages. I remember feeling like it was so surreal and watching my wife grieve that. And uh, I remember watching my wife labor, three babies. I was in for all of them. I didn't video it. I thought that would be weird. Uh, <laughs> But I remember just feeling like that some type of incredible, miraculous, divine strength showed up in my wife as she was laboring to give birth to these three kids. The third, Isaiah, gave birth to him entirely naturally, which was like the, the most incredible superhuman thing I'd ever seen. I actually have a, a tattoo on my arm from that of my wife flexing. Uh, that's not true. Just... Um, <laughs> <laughs> of my wife's name and some flowers and all that. I thought that would be more appropriate. Um, and then I watched my wife as she, as, she, as she planned, right, and as she built this home, as she created this nest. And, and my wife is, is just, she's an incredible mom. I have so many memories that, uh, that I, uh, I can't believe that God gave me a good wife who's also a good mom, right? And so I just want to uh, honor Ash today. I want to honor my mom, Elaine Maglioka, today for all the memories that they've given me. Uh, if I were going to get theological, maybe I would say M is for Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I love Mary's story because I think that Mary is somebody who shows us what it looks like to be asked to do something impossible. Can you imagine? An angel comes to you and says, I want you to raise the Son of God. 
<laughs> that seems like an impossible task. Maybe it feels a little bit more impossible than you trying to raise your kids, but I don't think probably that much. I think that motherhood is an impossible ask in many ways. And I think that moms are those good souls who simply say, yes, I'll step into this impossible task and I'll do this impossible thing and I need you to help me, but I'm going to do something impossible. That's what motherhood is. And Mary was somebody who was imperfect. I hope that you know that. We know of traditions that kind of make Mary into this saint. Mary wasn't a saint. Mary needed a savior. She wasn't perfect, but she was willing and she was submitted and if there's not a clearer understanding of biblical motherhood than that, I don't know what it is. God calls an imperfect person to do an impossible thing, and that person just has to be willing and submitted. That's what being a parent is, right? Being a parent isn't perfection. Being a parent isn't meeting a standard. Being a parent is every day knowing, I need Jesus to save me and these kids. <laughs> and so if you're in here today, Mary's a great example for you. So M for memories, M for Mary, maybe M for Merlot <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> or margarita. <laughs> or mimosa. <laughs> Moscow mule, martini, mojito. <laughs> Mai Tai, Manhattan, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I'm not judging, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, lots of M's, lots of M's. <laughs> How about M is for the many who get left out? Uh, Mother's Day is a hard day for some of you. Maybe your mom is not doing well. She's, she's, uh, she's sick. She hasn't been doing well. Maybe you're estranged from your mom. Maybe you lost a mom. And this is a day where we're celebrating mothers and you're just mourning loss or, or difficulty. Maybe, uh, maybe you lost a child. Maybe you want to be a mom and God hasn't answered that yet. And so we look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and we say that God says that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Amen? Doesn't mean that we don't grieve. We grieve intensely, those things. We grieve the difficulties and the loss and the tragedies. And, and the Bible says that it's a holy and sacred ground when we celebrate together and when we grieve together. And so as we celebrate Moms, on one hand, we also grieve the complexity of this holiday. On the other hand, we acknowledge that this traditional celebration doesn't really cover all of the bases. Whenever Jesus talks about motherhood, he actually says in the Gospels that those who leave their father and their mother and their brothers and their sisters, even though there's a leaving for many of us as we step into faith, he says, I will repay that by the hundredfold. I'll give you brothers and sisters and mothers and so I'm a person that because of my faith, I have more brothers in the faith than I could have ever had in the natural. I have more sisters in faith. I have more mothers because of my faith, women who have invested in me, women who have mothered me, women who have guided me, women who have protected me. And on, there's not a card in the grocery aisle for them. And so I want to honor you today. I want to honor you, sisters. I want to honor you, mentors. I want to honor you, friends. I want to honor you, stepmoms and step in moms. I want to honor you adopted moms. I want to honor you aunts and aunts, depending upon what, what side of town you grew up on. I want to honor you grandmothers who stepped into the gap. I want to honor you sisters who felt more like mothers. I want to honor all of you women who make us more than we could be on our own. At your own loss many times, so thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure that there's no one left out on this Happy Mother's Day. Maybe M is for mixed feelings. I read an article uh, last week uh, about a survey that they took on Good Morning America. And the survey was asking Americans the top 10 television moms over the last several decades. Give us your, give us your top three, actually. Number one was Claire Huxtable. <laughs> Claire Huxtable. Let me explain to you who Claire Huxtable was. She had six kids, was always impeccably dressed, never had a hair out of place. Her home was always perfectly clean while she pursued a demanding and prestigious career. She's number one. No pressure, right? <laughs> number two was Marion Cunningham of Happy Days. Anyone watch Happy Days? Go ahead and timestamp yourself, <laughs> okay? This part of the room's like, I've never even heard of that. We know, we know, all right? But here's the deal with Marion Cunningham. She always had on an apron and a smile with perfectly white teeth. She's number two. And then my, number three is my favorite. Number three was Marge Simpson. Okay? 
There's hope for all of us. <laughs> Maybe Marge's M was that she was a martyr mourning that she married a moron. <laughs> and so if that's you today, we honor you as well, all right? <laughs> I think that sometimes I've talked to ladies about the whole experience, and sometimes I've heard women say that they suspect that the cards that they're getting have more to do with what we wish they were than what they actually are. And so sometimes moms read Mother's Day experiences as, Happy Mother's Day to a mom who has a perfect home, sets a perfect table, who has perfect kids, who does it all with perfect hair, a smile, and a good attitude in her heart. And there's some guilt connected to the sense of inability to attain to the expectation. So I want to talk to you today around expectations. And I want to tell you what my prayer is. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3, it says this, The Lord has anointed me to bring good news. I pray that most Sundays, that God would anoint me and that I could give you good news because I know you get bad news lots of places. Because I don't want this to be a place that you come in and get more heaviness. I want you to, this to be a place that you come in and you receive an influx and an infusion of good life. And so I want to pray that God anoints me to bring you good news. Here it is, to grant those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That's what I'm praying. Because I know that the enemy, he wants to make you faint in your spirit. He wants you to give up. He wants you to say, this is pointless. This is irrelevant. He wants you to believe that something that happens in anonymity means that it doesn't have any value. But the God who created you and loves you wants you each and every day to put on a garment of praise, put on a garment of gladness, to anoint yourself with God's Holy Spirit, to point yourself toward the work of the season that he's put you in. That they might be, here it is, this is what I want for you, ladies, that they might be oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That's what I want for you. I want you to be planted in the plans and purposes that God has for you. It doesn't mean you're never going to go through a valley. It means you're never going to go through it alone. It doesn't mean you're going to get to skip Monday. You've got to go through Monday, right? But it does mean that something is getting planted in you and through you that's for God's glory and our joy. And so I want to speak to you today about three M's. Three more M's. Very simple, but I hope very helpful. And I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 31 with me. And this is the spot where most of you groan because you're sensing an expectation coming. I'm going to try to say that M is for breaking the mold. M is for breaking the mold. And here's the famous verse in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10. Are you all good? Are you with me? Yes. Proverbs 31 and verse 10, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. Now, I have preached this message, I have heard this message, and I think that sometimes we unintentionally inform women that the virtuous woman has to do with vocation and location. I think nothing really could be further from the intent of the author. I don't think that the virtuous woman is about where she works and what she does for work. I think that Proverbs 31 transcends both gender and circumstance. And here's why I say that. Throughout the book of Proverbs, wisdom is described as a woman, not as a man. I know, bad news, guys. Wisdom is described as a woman. The virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31 is a tangible expression of the book's celebrated virtue of wisdom. In other words, the author is essentially showing us what wisdom looks like in action through a virtuous woman. It is a trajectory, a theology of what wisdom looks like, what it feels like, what it does, what it commits itself to. The intended audience of Proverbs 31 isn't women. It's men. The intended audience of Proverbs 31, it isn't you, ladies. And this is why, although if you've gone through a Proverbs 31 study, I trust that God used it, and I trust that God grew you through it, but most biblical renderings of a Proverbs 31 study should be to a men's small group. That's the intent of it. You say, how do you know? Proverbs 31 and verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. This is a woman talking to her son about two things, him staying away from alcohol that will make him stupid and finding women who will make him strong. That's the 
understanding, the theological understanding of this. In the Jewish community, there was a group of people who were called to memorize chapter, chapter 31, and it wasn't women. It was men. Men were supposed to be the intended audience. Men were supposed to meditate on this. Men were supposed to know this. This wasn't ever supposed to be an unmeetable standard by which women are condemned and told they need to be domesticated. That isn't the intent of Proverbs 31. It is, it is a misunderstanding of the exegetical intent of this book. Why is that important? Because when you get to Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10, the Hebrew word that Lemuel's mom uses, which we have as excellent in the ESV, we put a lot of different words on that, but this is an original word that had an original intent. So let me tell you what the word excellent means. It means valor. It means virtue. It has two connotations, one of military and the other of upper class. The word at the simplest means strong. A strong wife who can find. A wise wife who can find. A classy wife who can find. A wife who can put it on you when you need it. Who can find. That's what it's saying. And this mom is saying, King Lemuel, if you are going to step into all that God has for you, you will need a strong, classy woman who is stepping into all that God has for her. What is not indicated is that that woman will say or do or be certain things or places. If you just read the text for what it communicates, it talks about, yes, she has an investment and a presence in the home, but not only. It says that she has a presence and an investment in the community, but not only. It says that she has a business and that she has a work and that she has a staff and that she has a husband and that she has a kids. And for some reason, we have taken one of the many pieces of a strong, classy woman and only attributed it to stay-at-home moms. Now listen to me. I live with a woman who was a stay-at-home mom for a season. I was led by a woman who, until she became a single mom, was a stay-at-home mom for a season. I am grateful for stay-at-home moms. I am only saying that you can continue to follow God and not only be a stay-at-home mom. And I'm trying to free you. I'm trying to free you from an expectation when you are battling in your heart with desires that you think God might have put there. And I'm trying to free you from what mostly concerns me, which is that you think that once your kids leave your home, your life is over. Your life is not over. You still have a ministry, you still have wisdom, you still have strength, you still have virtue, you're still called to be a Proverbs 31 woman, and your man should continue to be investing toward that. I'm trying to free you from the mold that says that a virtuous woman has a location and a vocation. There isn't a mold for that. This is speaking about character, not where you work. This is speaking about your heart, not where you're located. This is speaking about your strength and your wisdom and your pursuits. And so I want to free you from this thing that I think gets put on many of us. And I also want to remind you this. Our standard, our standard is not a concept. Our standard is not a hypothetical woman. Our standard is not a biblical character. Our standard is Jesus. Our standard is Jesus, and I want you to stay away from things that might be good but aren't Jesus, because ultimately what those things will do is they will give you a standard that God never intended you to meet. You say, why do you say that? Because the gospel is that God puts a standard in front of you that requires a Savior for you, and his name is Jesus. And it doesn't change if you're a stay-at-home mom or the CEO female of a, of a, of a company. You still need Jesus. And so I want to remind you today that Jesus says that he loves you. And Jesus says that he made you. And Jesus says that he had a design for you that pointed you toward the good works that he created you for. The book of Ephesians says that you were designed toward good works. What are they, ladies? The God who loves you created you toward them, formed you toward them. Jesus loves you and offers you freedom because of who he made you to be. Jesus does not condemn you for whatever unspoken standard you are or aren't attaining to. That's not the gospel. That's legalism. Jesus, please listen to this. Jesus does not expect perfection from you, moms. Jesus meets perfection for you. 
And some of us are walking around with a standard that Jesus already met so that he could offer you rest. Jesus meets the standard so that I can rest in his grace. Jesus does for me what I was never created to do for myself. God never intended you to save yourself by being the best mother in the world. He intended you to trust Jesus for the grace that you needed to be the mom he called you to be. Jesus says, enough. <laughs> You're enough. It's enough. He's enough. Listen, God is happy with you right now regardless of what happens in your mothering tomorrow. God doesn't need anything from you. He got everything that he needed to match his justice and his holiness on the cross of Calvary. That's what a Christian is, even a Christian mom. Somebody who hangs the hat of their identity, of their dependence, of their gladness, of their strength, on their wisdom, not on their ability, but on Jesus' ability. Proverbs 31 is not a standard of to-dos for you, ladies. If you look at this as a standard of to-dos, it will, and for many of you, has crushed you. And so Jesus says, I am the standard. I meet the standard. I see you. I delight in you. I delight over you. I'm proud of you as you sit right now. I don't need any more productivity from you. I don't need good attitudes from you. <laughs> I don't need perfect smiles from you. I need you to trust my son who loves you, who's, who died for you, who does for you what you need as a mom, as a woman, as a man, in the home, in the marketplace, wherever God has created you to be, Jesus is enough. Amen? Amen. And so M is for breaking the mold. Two, M is for mirroring. This is one of my favorite things about God. I I've talked to you about just some of the difficulties that I have with God as Father. So many of you in this room, you have issues with God as Father because of your own earthly father. But now that I am a father of three kids, I, I love the fact that I have a good and perfect heavenly father. I love the fact that God says, I am a father to you, that you have brothers and sisters whose father is God. I love that when Jesus says, when you pray, pray in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. We, we love all that. And in so many ways, God communicates himself as a father. But what we tend to miss, especially in Western culture, is that God communicates a mother's heart. God communicates the title of father, but he communicates the heart of a mother. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 13, he says it this way. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You know, whenever you need comforted, you don't go looking for dad, right? You don't go looking for dad. You go looking for mom. You want mom to put her arms around you. You want mom to kiss on you. You want mom to be present with you. And sometimes we have this conception of God that God is up there just judging our rights and our wrongs and hoping that we just perform better and try harder. God says, no, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a God who wants to cover you like your mother. Like your mother, that, that's his heart. Here's another one that I love, Isaiah 49. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Have you been there? God has left me, man. God is ignoring me. My prayers are hitting the ceiling and rolling around on the floor in front of me. God's not paying attention. God doesn't care. Now, a father would say, that's not true. Let me tell you what is true. That's not what he says. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these might forget, but you I will not forget. I've watched my wife nurse all three of our kids. This level of connectivity, that listen, there's no way for me as a dad to simulate, right? The, the concept of my wife forgetting those experiences or forgetting those kids that they nursed is completely foreign to me. It couldn't possibly happen. There's no scenario or circumstance in which I would think that Ashley Dunn would forget that young man sitting on the, on, on, on the front row. It's logical. It's understandable. Here's what God says. Even if that could happen, that won't happen with me. I won't forget you. I won't forsake you. This isn't about the rights and the wrongs and the moral and the immoral and the efforts and the principles. This is about the heart of God for you. Here's what I'm trying to say to you, ladies. I'm trying to say to you that your job, your job, ladies, as moms, is to be yourself. 
period. It's to be yourself. It's to be who God made you to be. Not some version of you, not some, it would be better if it was, I was like them or if I had this. It's for you to, as we said last week, to bloom where you planted, how God made you to be with the gifts and the plans and the purposes that God has built incarnate inside of you. Let me say it to you this way. Uh, our executive pastor, his wife's name is Ann, Ann Baxter. She is a lovely lady. She loves the Lord. She is strong. She is wise. She's a great leader in every way, shape, or form. My family, the Dunn family, doesn't need Anne. We need Ashley. God knew sovereignly whenever he put my wife in our family that I needed her and that she needed me and that my kids needed her and that she needed them. God is sovereign enough to put you in the family that you're in. So ladies, hear me. Don't think that your family needs someone other than you. God put you in that family to be who he called you to be. Your job is to be it, to be in pursuit of it with strength and wisdom, to be virtuous, to be a strong, classy lady in your context. Your job is to be you, not some caricature of what you think the church anticipates you being. And here's what happens. When you are in pursuit of the identity that God has given you with the strength and wisdom that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you mirror the heart of God in a way that is unique to any other relationship. There are things that I am not capable of teaching my children because of my gender. I need my wife to do it. There are things that I'm not capable of investing into my kids, even my boys. I need my wife to do it. That the heart of God that is this mother hen, the heart of God that is this nursing mother, the heart of God that is this comforting mom, if my wife abdicates that in pursuit of what somebody else is saying, my kids and I lose it. Ladies, you are entirely indispensable to your family. You are entirely indispensable to your physical family, and you are entirely indispensable to your spiritual family called Graceway. I don't need you to be somebody else. I need you to be you who God made you to be gladly. I need you to be in pursuit of that with strength and with wisdom. And when you do, you generate love in us. I don't know how this works, but I know that God teaches you to love a little baby as it is generated inside of you. And then I know that once that little baby comes out, that you have the ability to generate in love inside of it in a way that a father does not. I think it's true spiritually. I think it's true physically. And so I want to say to you, ladies, that if you'll break the mold and just be in pursuit of who God made you to be, that pursuit will mirror the heart of God in a way that is unique and indispensable to those around you. It will bring him glory. It will bring us joy. You are free to do it. We need you to do it. Nobody else will stand in the gap for it unless you do, unless you do. Lastly, M is for more. M is for more. There's not that many times in the Bible where God tells us to praise a person. Have you ever thought about this? Most of the time when God's talking about praise, he's talking about receiving it. Most of the time when God's talking about praise, he's talking about being worthy of it. Not in the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 31 and verse 28, it says this, her children will rise up and will call her blessed. There will come a day where your investment will bear fruit, imperfect as it is, willing as it is, submitted as it is. It will bear fruit. Your children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he, what? He praises her. Now, if you grew up in a conservative church, that feels a little weird to you, right? I'm going to praise her. But that's what God calls us to do, and that's what God prophetically says over your life. And so on this Mother's Day, moms of all kinds, physical moms, biological moms, spiritual moms, step-in moms, stepmoms, adoptive moms, sisters, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, friends, sisters, we rise up and we praise you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for your vulnerability. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your classiness. We thank you from time to time you'll put a good slap on us. We need it, all right? We rise up and we praise you. We honor you. We thank you and we believe that as we do, we give glory to God who created you just as you are.
We thank you for making us more. We acknowledge that you are more than we give you credit for sometimes, and we ask your forgiveness for it. But we're glad to have you in our lives. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. We are super stoked to announce our new album, One Savior, is available today. So you can go to gracewayworship.com to download your free copy, or you can stream it on Apple Music or Spotify. We hope you enjoy it. 